Hello everyone, my name is George Adamidis and I'm a PhD student at Democritus University of Thrace at the Department of Agricultural Development and I'm a member of the Laboratory of Agricultural Pharmacology and Ecotoxicology. I am conducting my PhD study under the supervision of Associate Professor Dr. Zisis Vrizas. Today, I will present to you this presentation titled Biotic Interactions and Processes Important for Agroecosystems. What is meant by the term agroecosystem? According to the European Union, agroecosystems are considered communities of plants and animals interacting with the physical and chemical environments that have been modified by people to produce as mentioned in the slide, food, fiber, fuel, and other products for humans to consume and process. Agroecosystems are composed by cropland and grassland. Actually, agroecosystems cover about 47% of the European Union's land area. And what actually is considered to be an agroecosystem, it is a system which aims to maximize production without causing reduction of the sustainability of it. Agroecosystems are complex and diverse ecosystems and they are composed by some major groups of biotic organisms. The main ones are host insects, weeds, rodents, birds and soil microbiota. And we move on to some logical questions that are derived by what the human intensification has brought to agroecosystems and the products that come out of them. Pesticide residues in water and soil, depositions of pollutants such as nitrogen and sulfur causing acidification and eutrophication. Numerous exceedances of MRLs. Pesticides have adverse impacts on non-target organisms. Climate changes may negatively, may negatively impact the productivity of important annual crop species or eliminate autochthonous species. The last of the presented questions of this slide will be answered in the upcoming parts of this presentation. Moving on to the relation of climate change and its effect on the agroecosystems. Agroecosystems are shaped by climatic conditions. By that we mean that planting and sowing dates, the choice of species varieties, irrigation and other factors are defined by climate change and the extreme conditions that it may bring on different agroecosystems. The data of studies of recent years shows that the European climatic conditions are being shaped to have longer warm periods and milder winters. That affects plant communities, composition, diversity, and traits that were correlated to withstanding cold periods of time. That brings us to the conclusion that the impact of climatic changes in agroecosystems disrupts biotic interactions of different species and impacts biodiversity of ecosystems. So, Let's see when and what biotic interactions occur in ecosystems. Biotic interactions fall into three categories. Predation, competition, and symbiosis. Each one also subcategorizes to intra and interspecific. As a result, of all these interactions, organisms that make up these ecosystems 
evolve to maximize the benefit of them and minimize the adverse effects. The challenge of decreasing the chemical inputs on agroecosystems and enhance biotic interactions is what is required to promote sustainability to those systems. Various biotic interactions happen between and within different species and trophic levels in agroecosystems. Some of them are those listed in this slide. Most of these interactions happen on soil level, so apart from climate change, tillage can also disturb these interactions. So let's move on to see what disturbances affect agroecosystems. The degree of disturbance in agroecosystems varies greatly in terms of frequency, intensity, and the type of it. The most dominant factors are tillage operations, application of pesticides and herbicides, and crop harvest. One of the most disturbed systems in agriculture is the vegetable production system, which is well tilled, so the seedbed ensures good seed contact to ensure germination and seedling, seedling establishment. And because most of the plants cultivated in this system are poor competitors. Disturbance derived from tillage disrupts complex above and below ground trophic chains, exposes soil to erosion and disrupts soil structure by reducing microsite diversity, which derives from the reduction of structural and functional diversity of the associated microbial communities. Reduced tillage systems help to avoid many of the problems associated with frequent physical disturbance, such as soil erosion and disruption of trophic food webs, and also reduce use of fuel. But in most cases, reduced or no tillage systems lead to higher amounts of herbicide being used for weed control, which leads to groundwater contamination and tolerant weeds. The disruption of complex food webs in soils can contribute to reduced disease suppressive ability, loss of arbuscular mycorrhizal associations and reduced efficiency of microbially mediated processes such as nutrient recycling, degradation of toxic residues, maintenance of soil structure and aggregation. This conclusion leads us to the next slide and chapter of this presentation. Weed management and sustainability. Can we manipulate interactions between weeds and crops to ensure weed suppression and reduce or eliminate herbicide use in agroecosystems? The answer is yes, but many factors must be taken into consideration and many steps must be outlined and then taken to reach sustainability. Weed suppression tactics are based around three major points. Weeds and crops directly compete for resources, but indirect changes in pest and disease dynamics can enhance weed management through viability of the crop. The presence of soil seed banks of weeds require long-term management tactics to manage weed population growth through control of annual seed input and increase seed predation through granivores and viability of pre-existing seed banks. The strongest selection factor in weed populations in recent years is herbicide use. The herbicide tolerant populations 
create massive challenges for growers, especially on reduced or no tillage production systems. The approach of weed management should include both short and long-term strategies. The first group of tactics are those that reduce weed growth and fecundity during the growth cycle, and the second group are those that reduce weed seed survival. The use of allelopathic residues as surface mulches is a strategy that has high potential to suppress weed development and ensures crop growth without standing it. The use of allelopathic plants as cover crops, or as they called live mulches, can be difficult to manage and exterminate right before the installment of the main crop, so the possibility of breeding allelopathic populations of plants for their extract to use as natural herbicide also gives a new angle to biotic interactions in agroecosystems which will lead to sustainability when it comes to weed management and herbicide use. Trophic interactions are a key element of community dynamics in agroecosystems. Interactions occur not only between adjacent trophic levels, such as crop and herbivore, but also as indirect effects across multi multiple trophic levels. For example, effects of predation can extend to lower trophic levels, which is a phenomenon referred to as trophic cascade. Many effects have been demonstrated of top predators on lower trophic levels in terrestrial systems. In fact, enhancing natural enemy populations to reduce crop pests, resulting in a positive top-down effect on crop productivity, is a fundamental approach of biological, biological control of crop pests in agroecosystems. But interactions can also occur in the other direction, which is referred as bottom-up effect. To give you an example, the chemical composition of plant tissue can affect the behavior of natural enemies directly through chemical cues for finding prey or indirectly through the effects on herbivore populations. Another major biotic interaction that occurs in ecosystems is the biotic interaction between soil microbiota and plants and specifically the ability of soil microorganisms to suppress plant diseases. This ability is due to a combination of general suppression which is related to overall microbial biomass and microbial activity and specific suppression which occurs from the effects of individual or selected groups of organisms or of microorganisms on specific pathogens. General disease suppression is thought to be caused by increased competition for nutrients, especially soil carbon, when microbial activity is increased in numbers. I provide an example of a case study where general, general suppression and specific suppression medicated the effect of this specific pathogen. As for specific suppression, studies have showed that non-pathogenic strains of diseases cause fungi and AMF to act as biocontrol agents in suppression of certain diseases. This is linked with the phenomenon of intermediate resistance. Intermediate resistance has the potential to be a keystone in integrated pest and disease management of foliar diseases, especially on agroecosystems where no chemical input is being used, and for which 
there aren't many options of control existing. In the case study example given, plant associated bacteria, apart from their, their plant growth promoting capability, showed to elicit plant defense mechanisms. Many are from the rhizosphere, but others are from the phylosphere and from the inside of the tissues of healthy plants. Other studies have found that compatible mixtures of rhizobacteria are more effective than single strains. Biotic interactions are also at the heart of nutrient cycling and important mediators of nutrient availability. The identification of soil organisms and structure and the structure and composition of soil food webs has increased greatly in recent times, as has our ability to measure fluxes of nutrients as they cycle through different components of the ecosystem. Plants can also change root structure and physiology in response to perceived nutrient deficiencies and there is the possibility of breeding plants more capable of secreting compounds that increase the availability of nutrients in the rhizosphere as well as make them better hosts of rhizospheric organisms. This mutualism between plants and microorganisms does give an alternative to chemical fertilization and promotes the general idea of advancing to a new era of IPM cropping and biological agriculture. In the next slide, I will mention some of these mutualistic behaviors and outcomes of them. As I mentioned before, many biotic interactions between plants and soil microbiota can elicit defense mechanisms for plants. This microbiota can play a very important role in agroecosystems for their plant growth capability as well. Some common biotic interactions of this sort happen between crop cultivated plants and rhizospheric bacteria and AMF. Another important mutualism is the relationship between AMF and plant roots. The ability of AM interactions to suppress soil-borne diseases was mentioned earlier, but they can also affect phosphorus and micronutrient uptake. Some of the most common interactions is the one between N-fixing bacteria and certain plants. This mutualism is the most important for agroecosystems, especially the ones that cultivate legume plants. Many of the approaches for increasing soil suppressiveness to plant pathogens can also be used for the suppression of plant parasitic nematodes. As with soil-borne diseases, both general and specific types of suppressiveness to pathogenic nematodes have been identified. For example, combinations of plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, organic amendments and phytochemicals can be incorporated into transplant mixes and suppress root node nematodes in, tom in tomato transplants. Moving on to another category of biotic interactions, this between insects and weeds. Weeds can affect the population and occurrence of, benefic of beneficial insects, such as natural enemies of crop pests. The boost of population of many natural enemies can be achieved through the use of unharvested strips of crop, windflower borders, buffer zones, and other techniques. Intercropping with bunker plants 
can also affect the abundance of natural enemy species and also pro prolong the lifespan of the natural enemies. Here I provide for you some pictures of intercropping fields and buffer zones. Vegetative buffers or uncropped fields, field margins in agricultural landscapes can provide a range of ecological services. They can provide habitat and food for wildlife, contribute to conservation of native flora, and reduce erosion. They can also prevent the runoff and pesticide drift. They also help to sustain beneficial arthropod species. In agricultural landscapes dominated by large monocultures, many arthropod species tend to suffer from a lack of nectar and pollen sources. Shelter and hibernation mating and nesting sites. In the absence of these vital resources, colonization numbers of natural predators is smaller than that of herbivory pests. This can prevent predators from controlling pest populations whose numbers are increasing during the critical early period of crop establishment and growth. Improving the ability of food, shelter, and other resources on a more year-round basis can boost biological pest control by increasing predator populations and enhancing certain efficacy in the crop. It has been well established that nectar or pollen feeding is essential for the reproductive success of many insect predators and parasitoids. Several studies have shown that vegetative buffers provide these resources. They improve the reproductive success of natural enemies and that this may lead to reduced populations of pest species in the crop. In the next part of the presentation, we will discuss the biotic interactions between insects in agroecosystems. Studies have revealed that the release of a natural enemy of an exotic species pest as a repressive agent can actually be an effective solution to the problem. But this tactic has proven in most cases to be expensive and does sometimes control less than pesticide applications. So, a number of factors limit the efficacy of augmentation of the released agent in the selected habitat. These are the unfavorable environmental conditions, the mortality, the inadequate dispersal of the released agent, and the predation of released agents. We now continue to another biotic interaction occurring in agroecosystems, and that is the interaction between insects and microorganisms and the manipulation of repressive abilities of the latter. Many bacterial species inhabit the bodies of insects, but no many of have the ability to behave as insect pathogens. Many of the known with this ability are commercially available and are being used in the European Union as a supplementary action of pest controlling in integrated pest management and as a main pest control factor in bioagriculture, where the product has the clearance to be used. Some of the most popular formulations are those that have various strains of Bacillus thuringiensis in them. Among the most common microbial insecticides are the entomopathogenic fungi or EPFs, which are used in half of all classical biological control programs. Historically, 
the use of microbiota as a repressive agent of insects has taken the form of microbial insecticides. These pesticides were and are applied as microbes or spores directly to the field. Several attributes of uh, EPFs make them ideal candidates for biological control agents. Many can be mass cultured in vitro. The fungal spores have a long shelf life compared to other biological control agents and they are often capable of persisting in the host population without repeated introductions. When these endomopathogens are used as biological control agents, they have several advantages over conventional insecticides. They are often host-specific. They reduce impact on, uh, on non-target species. They are usually harmless to humans, so as an outcome, they can be used in organic farming and integrated pest management programs. And they are less susceptible to the pest resistance issues of conventional products. In this slide, I will present to you many of the biotic interactions occurring between microbes in agroecosystems and the potential use of them in IPM or organic farming. I will start by addressing the ability of pathogenic microbes that can increase the susceptibility of their host plant to colonization by other microbes which would not, normal, not normally be invasive. S studies have shown that if a pathogen is introduced to the plant on the same day or before inoculation with an endophyte, disease resistance is more strongly reduced than when the endophyte has already colonized the host plant. There are also cases of endophytes being used, being able to inhibit a pathogen when they were inoculated together on the host plant. This ability of certain endophytes to suppress or inhibit the action of pathogens gives a new perspective to IPM and organic agriculture and moves us towards sustainability of agroecosystems through lessening the agrochemical inputs for managing foliar, stem or root pathogens. Summing up, this flowchart actually sums the individual chapters that were presented. Each category is summed as for its potential outcome. The final step is that of a sustainable agriculture and the general preservation of the environment, and specifically the agroecosystems. Through utilizing and manipulating the biotic interactions on all levels and factors that do occur in them. And we finally reach the conclusions of this presentation. Current research teams in ecology and evolution are providing useful concepts and tools which improve our ability to gain insights into the functioning of agroecosystems. Important elements of understanding biotic interactions include the consideration of the effects of diversity, species composition, and food web structure on ecosystem processes, the impacts of timing, frequency, and intensity of disturbance, and the importance of multitrophic interactions. Such understanding is very important because manipulating or enhancing biotic interactions is a way to reduce environmental and human health risk, since chemical inputs can be replaced or decreased and critical amount of water used for irrigation can be saved. In general, Handling biotic interactions through the complex assembly of agriculture, of agricultural techniques, 
at various temporal and spatial scales seems to be highly promising. The management of biotic interactions is not necessarily gentler than conventional agriculture and may also have undesirable effects such as the introduction of invasive species or loss of biodiversity. Thank you all for watching this presentation.